morning. The Bible reading this morning is taken from Acts chapter 4 from verse 32 to 11 of chapter 5. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one complained that any of their possessions were their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, bought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen. The feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out also. At that moment she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks so much, Adrian. Um, yeah, we're going to keep going through Acts as, as we've been doing today. And um, yeah, potentially one of the most difficult um, and challenging passages in the book if, if you've been Reading it, reading it, or maybe you came and we, we did some time reading it out loud after the service a few weeks ago, and there's kind of all these amazing, awesome things happening, and then you get to chapter five, and it's like, whoa, that's intense, <laughs> like, what do we make of that? And, and um, yeah, really, as, as we've been going through the story, uh, I've just been talking about how it's about what Jesus is still doing now, he's alive by the Holy Spirit, and he's doing amazing things, and people are coming to believe, but then there's also been opposition um, and there's been authorities who are not happy about what's happening and telling these, the church to stop speaking and um, there's, there's conflict and, and danger. Um, yet, even in that, God's at, at work and we've been looking at that over the last little bit and Matt shared about that last week as well and, and how the church in response to the opposition decided to pray and recognize that God's above it all and that they need God's power and to be able to speak boldly and then they experience the Holy Spirit giving them courage and boldness to go on speaking. So it's kind of like that, that God's doing these things and then there's an opposition, but then God even uses the opposition to do a deeper work in people that leads to more good things and it, God will take what is coming against and actually use that for good as well. 
And we really see that's happening again in this story, that the Holy Spirit is working in the community in a, in a powerful way, uh, transforming people's attitude even to things like their money and their possessions. Um, but also in this community where the Holy Spirit's moving powerfully, there, there's another form of opposition and danger, and this is not from the outside, but actually from the inside. So what we actually can learn about today is, is what it can look like when the Holy Spirit's at work in, in His church, um, but also some of the dangers that we need to be aware of, um, and, and there's some warnings for us in this today as well. So let's, um, let's pray, and then we'll go through this passage together. We thank you, Lord, um, yeah, for your word. <clears throat> we know there's, there are parts of it that are hard to understand that raise sometimes more questions than answers, and and yeah, this is definitely one of them, but yeah, we know that you're good and your heart is for us, that you're gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and are rich in love. And just pray, God, that you'd help us to understand and know your heart and um, your ways. And we thank you that in love you do warn us um, and, and challenge us. So we pray today, God, for your protection over this time. You speak truth to our hearts and bring freedom and life by the power of your spirit. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, yeah, so this, this passage is just after where we left off last week, that the church has prayed for boldness and something amazing has happened. The whole room shakes and it says they're all filled with the Spirit. And it's, it's about being bold to speak, but it, it seems like as a result, they just have this new freedom from fear. They're not living in fear of opposition. They're not living in fear of people. And that freedom from fear transforms even their attitude toward each other and their attitude towards their things. Um, so this is a summary um, of what's happening in the community in, um, yeah, chapter 4, verse 32. It says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great pow- power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there was no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. So there's, there's a grace of God at work in the community. It says that there's great grace and great power. So because Jesus is alive and the Holy Spirit is present, God's moving in this community, and it's transforming them in their attitude toward each other, and in their attitude and action toward their possessions in this community. This is like an amazing picture of what it's like, that there's this great sense of humility and that they are humble and united as one, that they have this oneness of heart and mind that, that, that it, it, they, this is not, they still retain ownership of their things, but they count them as being everybody's things. They, they share them with each other. They, they feel this sense of great unity which then actually does lead to acts of radical generosity, where when there's people in need, it's like there's something that God's doing in this community that that people start to, of their own accord, go and sell their possessions and and things that that were really significant, like houses and land, um, and come and and surrender the money and and say, this is for anyone in need in the community. And this um, was a significant thing because... There would have been lots of people in need in the church community. Many people would have been had travelled to Jerusalem, not lived there, not had work, would have been totally dependent. Um, so that there was a particular need at this time for for people to be supported in large numbers at, right at the start of this movement. Um, and but what happens is really this amazing picture of a community where there's no one in need. Uh, and what's amazing is that this has actually been God's desire. Um, in reference all the way back in Deuteronomy, that he would have a people who he dwells with, and as a result of that, that there are people characterized by generosity so that there's no one who is poor. And, and that's described in Deuteronomy, but they're not really experienced. But they're experiencing this here. It's a sign that this is actually what it's like for people to be in community with God's presence at work. There's a freedom from poverty. That actually, there's no need for people to be poor. And part of the reason for that is because people are experiencing a freedom from possessions. They're not freed and bound by their possessions and their money. They're actually free to be generous, and then that's freeing people from poverty. There's this amazing sense of freedom that comes from the Spirit. And again, it's because 
of Jesus' resurrection and because God's actually doing something in the community. And it's because of that, but then also what's happening becomes a sign of the fact that Jesus is alive. And the community, through these concrete acts, are becoming a witness. Uh, and then the, it describes one particular person who's an example of what is happening, uh, whose name is Joseph, or often called Barnabas. It says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. So he is really held up as an example of someone who represents and reflects the work that the Spirit's doing. So it's not, it's not everybody doing this, but there is a number of people, and it, and it seems that he's particularly, this is a particular story that people started to tell and share that this man generously, uh, which brought a lot of encouragement, came and surrendered the field that he had. There's this move of humility and generosity. And what I think this passage does is shows us that this is actually what the Spirit does. This is what God desires, that the Spirit works to create people who, like Jesus, live with genuine humility and sacrificial generosity. That that's what they are experiencing in a, in a genuine way. And, and this is described not as like an abstract ideal, but, but actually people in concrete ways in that community experiencing a freedom from poverty and a freedom from possessions. Um, they're, they're actually practicing this. And what it does is, is, I think, is designed to show us a picture of what God's kingdom is supposed to look like and, and be like, what the Spirit wants to do and create. Um, that this is actually uh, not um, presented as an obligation. Um, and even in this passage, it's not even presented as like a really difficult thing, like it's really hard to be generous or, or humble. It's, it's, it's presented as this is life, like this is joy. This is actually what we're invited to in the outworking of God in the, in the community. Um, the passage does read a bit like an ideal, but as we go on, we'll see the community wasn't perfectly ideal. There were definitely issues. So the, the point is not so much for us to read that and say, well, I haven't experienced that. Like, that's just unrealistic. The, the point is that that's what the Spirit was doing, and that's the direction God wants to grow us continually. That's, that's what it looks like when He's truly at work in our hearts. And the question is, is that the direction that we want to go in, that we want Him to grow us in as well? So I'm going to just take a moment to, to pause and just reflect on that point and, and give you a moment to pray. Um, I've just got a question and a prayer that you could pray um, to think, what could it look like for you personally and for us as a church family to grow in these things in humility, generosity, unity, and a contentment that comes from the Spirit at work? Like, like there's, a, there's a picture described in this passage, but to think about what would that look like in your life or in our church? And then to pray and ask God for that, for... Um, for God to move in your own heart and our community to grow us to practice these things in concrete ways so we can better reflect Jesus. Um, so I'll just give you a moment to do that now. And it's a good picture for us as, as really, in, if you think about what is the, the goal, I guess, of following Jesus or growing as a church. And in Acts, obviously, it does talk about growing in number, that people are added. And obviously, we want to grow and want people to know God and, and meet Jesus. But, but really, what growth 
ought to look like is growth in humility and growth in generosity and growth in unity. Like that's the evidence of the Spirit at work and the things that we can look for and, and seek in ourselves and together as well. Um, but, but sometimes we talk about church in that way. It can, can be difficult because of, often in experience, it falls short of that. Um, and that's because this is not the, the, the picture, even in the early church, it appears like this was like an idyllic community with everyone sharing and everything's perfect. But we read straight after that that wasn't the case, that there were major problems and, and challenges. So the, there was something real and concrete happening. God was doing that. But there's also opposition even from the inside. Um, it's not totally perfect and ideal. And really the reason is because while the Spirit is doing a certain work, there is an opposition, there's an enemy who's seeking to corrupt and really do the opposite to what the Spirit is doing, tempting people not towards humility and generosity, but towards the opposite things, people in the church. So we see that in this story about Ananias and Sapphira. So I'll just read the first four verses of chapter 5. It says, Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God." And this is a very <clears throat> challenging story, and there's a lot in it, um, but uh, I think one thing that's helped me even studying it is just actually reading it in the context of what's just happened. Because if you read this as an isolated story, it kind of can just seem random and strange, but if you read it, that this is in contrast to what has just been described, that, that Luke, and he's writing, it, is highlighting that contrast, that what... Barnabas has just done, uh, and clearly presented as something inspired by the Spirit that's been honoured in the, the community as a positive example, this couple effectively do a very, very similar thing, but it's incredibly negative and becomes a warning of something not to do. So there's a, there's a strong contrast here. They're doing a very similar thing, but with a very different heart. And it shows that the heart is incredibly important. So, this is so intense that Peter, it's such an interesting picture, right? This, this man is coming to give a huge amount of money to the church, probably. All right. We don't know how much. We don't know how much they held back. But however much, they're giving a lot of money to the church. But Peter's response is that their heart is filled with Satan. <laughs> like, like, it's such an intense thing to say to someone who wants to give money to your church, right? Like, that's probably not what we would do. Um, we'd probably say, oh, thanks so much. Like, like, but but, just, but Peter, Peter says that. And there's a contrast again, like th that this act is actually not an act that's been filled and inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's an act that looks similar, but it's been inspired by the Spirit's enemy, by Satan. So there's, it's quite subtle and complex. But what perhaps is going on is that as a result of seeing Barnabas's act of generosity, which it seems that he hasn't done this for credit, but that he has credit in the community for it, that he has been held up as an honored example of what the Spirit is doing, inspiring humility and, and generosity. And as a result, it, it seems to be that there's respect in the community that comes through that. And perhaps this couple also wanted to be respected in the community for their generosity. But there's a problem is that they're actually not as generous as they would like people to think that they are. That's the issue. It's actually the reality of their heart. But instead of in humility accepting the truth of their heart, they devise a scheme to be able to be seen to be generous, while in truth actually secretly hiding their wealth. Is that's the, that's the problem here, and it's made worse because they didn't need to do this. Like. There was no expectation or obligation that people sell their possessions. It, there was something that was happening, but it was a free, voluntary thing. Um, but for some reason, they decided to sell their home, uh, told people that they were giving the full amount of the sale of their home, like what Barnabas has done. But then they decide secretly to keep some of it 
And this wasn't just like an under pressure kind of mistake in calculations. Like this was a determined, planned out lie. Like we're going to want people to think that we, we're giving it all, but actually we're going to keep this. No one's going to know. We'll just, we'll just keep it to ourselves. And this is presented as an incredibly dangerous thing to do. And we sometimes might think like, like lying's not good, but like, yeah, it's just, it's just lying. But, but here is the, the problem is that they're not just lying to people. They're actually thinking that they can trick God, actually can lie, lying to the Holy Spirit is what Peter really confronts them on. And again, it's not just a small lie. It's a, it's a bold lie that they hold to. Um, I'm just going to skip forward a little bit because um, Peter speaks to Ananias, and then he speaks to Sapphira afterwards. And we see that she's kind of tested and holds to the lie. It says in verse 8, Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price that you, Ananias, got for the land, like the price that they gave? And yes, she said, that's the price. Now, this is in, like in front of the whole church, like in front of the apostles, uh, just a bold lie. The house price was actually a lot more, but she lies. And Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? They both had a plan, and even when given an opportunity, in this case, to come clean, she didn't. There was this strong commitment to the lie. It seems like they both had this strong desire for spiritual reputation of being generous, but they also had a desire to retain wealth secretly. And these two desires, particularly combined, are so dangerous that they create this pride that thinks they can even trick not just the community, but God, and manipulate and lie to God. And this ultimately is something that they decide to do and are accountable for, but it's also inspired and a result of the temptation of the enemy who's seeking to do the opposite of what the Spirit's doing in the community. That while the Spirit is creating humility and generosity, the enemy works to corrupt those in the church by enticing them to use religious acts and the church community for self-advancement rather than self-sacrifice. Because it's so interesting, right, that this couple are doing something that looks incredibly generous and even kind of is in a sense in that, like, they're willing to give money. Like, so that we would say, well, that's generous, right? But what this passage presents it as, as this act is actually totally corrupt because the heart is totally wrong. And God actually doesn't really care about what something looks like. He cares about what it is. He cares about the heart. And if what the Spirit is doing is, and what the Spirit wants in the church is humility and generosity, then when someone is doing religious things, but the heart motivation is self-advancement and pride and greed and results in deception and hypocrisy, like God is against that and and he hates that. And it's even one of the main things that Jesus warns about as a strong spiritual danger. Um, Jesus warns in the Sermon on the Mount about the dangers of doing religious acts, things that are good, like praying and giving and fasting, the danger of doing them to be seen by the people, doing them for reputation um, And then Jesus also warns about the danger of trying to secure our lives by our wealth. He warns about the darkness of greed and how you cannot serve God and money. And in some ways, that's what their attempt is to do, is to to serve God, but we're also going to serve money. And it it creates this this lie. Um, Dallas Willard um, summarizes Jesus' teaching on these things as as really the two big dangers in the spiritual life. like risks, you could say risks of being in a church community, like that, that this, it could be us. Um, he says this, Jesus in Matthew 6 alerts us to two main things that will block or hinder our life, constantly interactive with God and healthy growth in the kingdom. These are the desire to have the approval of others, especially for being devout, and the desire to secure ourselves by means of material wealth. If we allow them to, these two desires will pull us out of the sway of the kingdom and back into the barren righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. But as we keep these two things in their proper place, through a constant and disciplined and clear-eyed reliance on God, we will go rapidly in the kingdom substance. It summarizes that these two things are actually really 
dangerous, and, and they are things that we may experience and, and, and do and have probably as, as a part of being in the church, that uh, if we come to church, if we follow Jesus, like these are the things that we do, um, but the heart behind them actually really matters, and there's subtle temptations and dangers that we could be doing things that look good, we could be doing the right things, but for the totally wrong reason. We could be praying, worshipping, we could be giving and serving the poor, but the enemy tempting us to not be doing those things as acts of sacrificial love, but actually as ways to advance ourselves in a community, as ways to appear to be something special, or ways to try and find security in ourselves um, and our wealth, rather than living before God's eyes and trusting in His care. So again, we'll take a moment just to, to reflect on that and just to encourage you maybe even to think like specifically, like think what are the things we do as a community, these things that Jesus describes, um, but what could it look like to actually be doing them without the right heart? How can we protect ourselves from that? Is a question and a prayer. In what ways could pride, greed, and hypocrisy be a danger for us who are in a church community seeking to serve God and each other? And then pray and ask God to protect your heart and our community from these dangers and rescue us when we fall into them. I'll just give you a moment to do that now. It's obviously a a challenge to us, but maybe could also be a helpful perspective as to the reason why, um, like, churches aren't ideal places, right? Like, like there's a picture of, like, oh, it should be this place of humility and generosity, and and then, yes, that's true. But it's also a place that's contested, where there'll be people who are doing good things for totally wrong reasons, and that will create damage, and, and there's a... There's, a, there's both sides at present in the community, and Jesus teaches parables on that as, as well. But, but just having that perspective can help us to interpret um, maybe when things aren't what maybe we think that they ought to be as well. And there's, there's different uh, dynamics at, at work because the spirits at work creating generosity, creating humility in the community. Barnabas is the example of that. But then the enemy is in, inspiring the opposite. And this couple who, again, are probably giving a lot of money but it's corrupt, they're actually lying to God. And, and that's all good and, like, challenging, right? But, but what's the most challenging thing about this passage is what happens to them as a result of doing this. Um, they die instantly. Like, it's so intense. It says this in verse 5. When Ananias heard this, Peter confronting him, he fell down and died. And great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some of the young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. So then she, he's out getting buried. After a while, his wife comes in, has the same confrontation. She holds to the lie. Peter says to her, listen, the feet of the buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. 
At that moment, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. This is the most difficult thing, right? It's so intense. And we could say, well, yes, what they did was really wrong, but like sudden death, like, is so confusing in many ways. Um, what we don't really know exactly what happened. It, it could partic- partly be um, the shock of public exposure. Like, they're seeking to be thought well of in the community, and now publicly in front of the community, they've been told that they're being inspired by Satan. <laughs> like, that maybe the shock of that creates this. But what's implicit, I think, in the passage is that this is something that God does, um, which is confusing because it doesn't seem like God's nature or heart. Um, We know God is compassionate and gracious, desires people to forgive, gives people time. So that raises a lot of questions. And the truth is there's probably more questions in this passage than necessarily answers. Um, But... That's what we do with Scripture. We, we wrestle with it. We, we ask the questions and we ask God to speak to it. And, and sometimes we won't necessarily have the answer we exactly want. But I can give a couple of thoughts today and then think, well, what is the point of this, at least for us? Um, I think one thing to recognize is that this kind of thing happening is rare. This is not uh, something that happens like all the time in the stories. Like, it's really, this just happens in this part, in Acts, right? Like, the, like God's heart is to be slow to anger, to, to bear with people. He's compassionate. Um, but then there are stories in Scripture when, when people do seem to cross a line or there's a, there's a particular context that, that leads to something like this happening. Um, there's another passage in Corinthians where, people, where Paul talks about people are really abusing communion and some people have fallen asleep. Um, I don't know if it's a battery or... I think it should be all right. I can sw- let me know if you want me to swap over. But, um, uh, so, yeah, it doesn't, it's not like a, it's not, this is not the norm, right? Like to, to, to happen. Um, and also, like we say, like, well, yeah, lying is bad, but like it's just a lie. But again, this is like a deliberate, persistent, like bold lie, and not just to people, but to God. And also, it's just at a key time in the life of the church. Like, the church is incredibly young, it is vulnerable, um, it doesn't have, like, a lot of necessary protection against becoming corrupted, and, and perhaps the Holy Spirit decides to work in a very decisive and clear way in this case, because religious hypocrisy is so dangerous, and, and this is a clear line drawn, like, that's not... Okay, and again, that doesn't answer all the questions, Um, but I think what we could say is that the purpose of the story is that it is a warning, and it actually is supposed to create a sense of fear in us. That what the result in this passage is that people go and tell people about this, and it creates great fear. Um, But that's actually presented as a positive thing. It's actually a good kind of fear that this community needs and that we actually also need and need to be reminded of as well. And that's what this passage can do for us. It's good to be reminded that it is dangerously, dangerous to treat God casually or to try to manipulate God. Um, to rec- it's important to recognize He is holy. It's right to fear Him who knows and sees our hearts. Again, this, this news is spread um, and it creates this sense of fear, but, it, but it's, a, it's a positive thing, but, which is also interesting because the passage just before that we looked at, like last week, was about being free from fear of people. Like the authorities are saying, you're not allowed to speak in Jesus' name. They, they say, God, give us boldness to speak so that we're not afraid. This passage, something happens that actually makes them fearful, but not of people, but of God. Uh, but that's actually positive to have the fear of God. And and. There's a complexity in Scripture around this because the Bible again and again says, don't be afraid. Jesus, arisen from the dead, says, don't be afraid. God doesn't want us to have a, He hasn't given us a spirit of fear. But then the Bible says again and again that it's good to fear God, that we are to fear God, that it's the beginning of wisdom to fear God. But if we think about it, like, it actually makes sense. Like He is God. He is holy. He is big. 
He is way bigger than us, and he sees everything. He sees our hearts. He sees our motivations. Recognizing that and living in that reality is, is good. To, to sort of deny that is, and, and just live as if he's not there is dangerous. But it doesn't mean we're to be afraid of him and hide from him because he wants us to come to him because he loves us and he's compassionate, he's kind and, and gracious. We don't have to cower in fear. It's interesting, even in this building we come into today, right, there are lots of dangerous things present in our building. Uh, we've been having different electrical work done recently. Um, uh, Gordon knows about it and has been helping with it. We've had an electrician who loves to point out how old all of our things are and how much upgrading they need and loves to highlight the fact that electricity is incredibly dangerous. <laughs> and if you press the wrong thing, if you mess with it, like... He, he says it's silent death, <laughs> like it's just over. And, but I don't think anyone's that afraid today of the electricity in the building, right? Like, like it's present, there's power at work in, the, in our building, but there's, there's nothing to be afraid of. But if you didn't have a healthy fear of it and you just went up to the switchboard and started crossing wires and changing things or like pushing things into plugs because you don't know about that or you sort of just don't respect it, like that's incredibly dangerous. Like, like that, you must not do that. There's a healthy fear that we don't do electrical work, like electricians do that, and they have a healthy fear because they know the dangers and what's involved. And I think potentially that's a little bit what's happening here, right? Like this couple are not fearing God. They're being flippant with God. They're thinking they can trick God. They're thinking they can manipulate him and the community for their own gain. And in a sense, they cross the cables and they suffer consequences. And there's a healthy fear that actually keeps us from being casual with God, keeps us from crossing a line or doing something spiritually dangerous. And really, in many ways, the way to live in the fear of God is to recognize that it's his opinion and it's his perspective, and it's him who can see everything, and that's actually what matters, not what other people do think. There's a healthy fear, um, and it's really the antidote to the danger of hypocrisy and doing things for the approval of others, um, it, that we don't have to fear what people think, but fear what God thinks and recognize we can't trick him, that he sees everything. So th there's a good fear in that sense in that he is holy, and I think there's a danger in the, and there's a good warning in this passage because the truth is that going down a path of religious hypocrisy and greed um, does end in death. Like it disconnects us from God. And it's not that God rejects us, but in a sense, we may harden our hearts again and again so that we appear to be people who love God but actually don't even care about Him. We care about everything else and we do religious things, but actually in our hearts don't. Honor him. Jesus' strongest warnings was for people like that, people who looked really good on the outside, people who were incredibly religious, but who just actually didn't fear God at all and actually didn't really care about God, and Jesus described them as dead on the inside. And this story is really in, intense and, and confusing, but it, it really is about the dangers of thinking that we could lie to God or we could manipulate God. Um, instead, we're called to humble ourselves before him and recognize that he sees all and ultimately it's his opinion that matters. So again, we're going to take a moment to, to reflect on that, um, to think about what that could look like for us as a church and personally. So um, a question and a prayer. What could it look like for you personally and us as a church family to live with a healthy fear of God? Pray and ask God to help you delight in the fear of the Lord, is a passage from Isaiah 11, and to live before your Father who sees in secret, which is what Jesus says to do in response to those dangers. So I'll just give you a moment to do that now.
Yeah, so today I suppose is an encouragement into those things that the Spirit desires to do, and it's a warning about the dangers and the ways the enemy might corrupt those in our hearts, that, and, and, a, and a reminder that maybe things might look good on the outside, but actually what matters is what's in our hearts, and they can easily and subtly be motivated by pride and greed, and we could become guilty of deceit and hypocrisy. And, and the truth is that we're probably all on a sliding scale of that, and it depends in different ways, and, and heart, our hearts are complex, and, and we often don't even know them ourselves, and there's mixed motivations, and we might not even be aware of the things that we're doing. And we may be tempted to think, well, it's not a really big deal, like a bit of pride, a bit of greed, like that's not a big deal, but, but this passage is a warning that, well, it is, like it's the way to death. And, and this couple in this story experienced that immediately, um, and obviously an extreme example, but the truth is, if we're guilty of that, we're no less deserving of that as well. And the truth is, we're all guilty of that, right? We're all guilty, uh, if you've been around church for a while, of hypocrisy, of, of doing good things for the wrong reasons, of God even doing something in your life, but then our response being to be proud about it and judgmental of others, or to be deceitful and make things look better than they actually are. And um, the bad news, right, is that God hates hypocrisy, uh, but the good news is that he loves hypocrites. He loved his enemies. He loves us while we were his enemies. He gave himself on the cross to rescue us. And even when we fail and fall short in this way, he loves us as his children and calls us back to himself. And his desire is that we simply come to him with honest hearts and open hearts. The good news is actually we don't have to pretend. We don't have to hide. We don't have to impress that's the one thing he doesn't want us to do. He doesn't want a show of religion. He doesn't want us to fake it. He doesn't want us to act more generous or more humble than we are. He simply wants us to recognize and confess where we actually are. And maybe we can actually say, well, actually, we're proud <laughs> or, or we're greedy. Or, like, he, we come and confess our sin and where we fall short because that's actually something he can work with. David says this in his confession in Psalm 51, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. We're going to come to respond with communion. And I think after a challenging message, it's such a good thing we can do to come around the bread and the cup and Jesus' body broken and his shed blood. And we come and acknowledge that we need forgiveness, we need grace. We can offer our broken, contrite hearts, confess our need of Him, and we can even confess that maybe we don't even see our need sometimes, or that maybe we've been self-deceived or hardened, and confess that to Him as well, and receive His mercy and grace afresh. Um, and then as we come and, and recognize Jesus' sacrifice for us, uh, and, and receive His mercy and grace again, can remember that actually what what led to the church being characterized by humility and by generosity was not like their effort or their desire to impress. It was a response to grace. It was because they'd experienced Jesus' grace, they were humble and they were generous. And as we come to communion, it's an opportunity again for us to experience grace and the free gift of forgiveness and love and mercy and the invitation is to let that transform our hearts so that we live in God's care and God's approval and God's generosity so we can be generous and humble to each other by the power of the Spirit, even with how we use our money and possessions. Second Corinthians 8 um, describes what Jesus did, which wasn't sell a house. It wasn't give up land. It was give up heaven and give his life. It says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. So let's pray and then invite you to come. And if you believe Jesus, come and receive the bread and the cup. And, um, and let's remember his sacrifice for us together. We thank you, Jesus, for your abundant grace and, and mercy and kindness um, to us as sinners. Thank you for how you bear with us, God, even in our pride, in our 
hypocrisy, in our deceit, Lord. Would you open our eyes? Would you forgive us our sins? Would you convict us and free us? We thank you that you desire truth in our hearts. You desire us to be open and honest before you. We ask that you'd protect us from these dangers. God, I ask you'd fill us with the right fear of you and respect for you and, and to live in awe of you and your holiness. We also experience your compassion and your mercy and grace. So Holy Spirit, as you uh, led the church and inspired generosity and humility and protected against hypocrisy and greed, would you do that in our community? Would you do that in our hearts? We just open ourselves up to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And please come as you're ready and, and take bread and a cup. And-